Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am Eddie Walker, Executive Director of Oklahoma Contemporary Arts Center, and it is my pleasure to welcome you, our virtual audience, as well as our in-person guests here at the Teata Theater. How proud we are to be the host of this homecoming exhibition, Ed Roche, OKLA. We thank the exhibition sponsors, the National Endowment for the Arts, Gagosian, Ad Astra Foundation, and Annie Bohannon. With additional support from Drew Williamson, UBS Private Wealth Management, the Chickasaw Nation, Katie McClendon, Ed Barth, and the Classen, Northwest Classen, class of 56. <laughs> Lastly, but not least, very special thanks to Dick and Glenna Tannenbaum. <laughs> Thank you all. And now, Please welcome exhibition co-curators, Alexandra Schwartz, and our own artistic director, Jeremiah Matthew Davis, and the man of the hour himself, Mr. Ed Roche. Welcome to the conversation here with Ed Roche and Dr. Alexander Schwartz. I am Jeremiah. Thank you, Eddie Walker, for the warm welcome. And thank you all for being here in the Teyada Theater for this experience. Uh, I know that our uh, Ed Roche of Oklahoma City needs no introduction for this room. But for our virtual audience, I thought it would be a good idea to give a brief bio of uh, Ed Roche, born in 1937 in Nebraska. A few short years later, the family moves to Oklahoma City. Uh, Ed grows up here very quickly, gets interested in art and photography by studying at the library. There was also a bust, I understand, of Shakespeare at your house that uh, your mother had. Had no effect on me. <laughs> <laughs> Wor words, mm -hmm. words, words, words might say otherwise. Uh, Ed, in 1956, after, as we all just learned, graduating from Northwest Classen, goes on an epic road trip to the city of Los Angeles where he matriculated at the Schoenard Art Institute, which has uh, become what we all know now as CalArts, the California Institute of the Arts. Uh, after graduating in 1960, he set about a career in the arts, both his own studio practice, also working in commercial arts, graphic design, print setting, all kinds of hustles on his way to uh, a prominent career in visual arts uh, for decades now at this point. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, arguably the exhibition that launched his career in 1962. Uh, we are fortunate that he is from the city of Oklahoma City and we are celebrating him tonight on Ed Roche Day and for the exhibition Ed Roche OKLA, not only the first exhibition of Ed's work in his home state, but also the first exhibition to focus on the theme of Oklahoma's enduring influence on his lifetime artistic output. So, Ed, let's get to it. <laughs> I'll pass the mic to you, Alex. Go ahead. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. So, Ed, it's remarkable that you've had exhibitions all over the world, but this is your first solo show in your hometown. I know also you haven't been here in a while because of the pandemic and other things. What's it like to be home? It's great to be back here and especially to have this exhibit here in this wonderful new building. I mean, it's like a you know, the plains of Oklahoma, and then you have this thrust of metal coming up to the skies. <laughs> and uh, I was here about two years ago when they were constructing this, and uh, it looked great. It was unfinished, but it, um, it really looked great and showed a lot of promise, and I love this place. Awesome, Ed. So now, Ed, tell us about your mother. <laughs> <laughs> We have, is that, her? Oh, yes, that it is. Is, I guess. we have the <laughs> earliest work in this exhibition is titled Dorothy Ruscha after your mom. It's a woodcut from 1960, the same year you graduated from Schoenard. Uh, anything you want to mention either about Dorothy or this particular woodcut? Mm, well, I had a special connection to my mother because she encouraged me and some of my friends like Mason Williams, who was a guitarist, 
and she encouraged us to think about making artistic statements. And uh, she, in her own way, was a very funny lady. And um, she would go into a restaurant, sit down, and the waitress would come up and say, what would you like? And she'd say, I'd like a nice cup of coffee. <laughs> that was, and I, you just can't forget things like that. It sounds better than a mean cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Shelby and Paul, you're in the house. Can you confirm or deny? <laughs> Sounds like affirmative. Uh, and Ed, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about Oklahoma E from 1962 for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that there is a, a beautifully rendered E, expert draftsmanship on your part, but also it's got uh, a facsimile of the comics page of the Daily Oklahoman that ran for decades and decades. I had a special connection to uh, the Daily Oklahoman because I was uh, I had paper routes for a few years, and um, it had some effect on me just meeting people and and um, and being my own sort of businessman with uh, selling newspapers and buying the newspapers and reselling them and delivering the papers. It, it was a special thing for me. So, and uh, let's see, I remember a guy named. Don Bowes, who was a um, the assistant uh, station manager, and he made me his assistant. And we would drive around in the morning and make sure papers were delivered. And he uh, he would turn on his car radio at five o'clock in the morning, and it was the uh, Bob and Ray show. Um, pretty abstract comedians, and um, <laughs> it kind of made me open up a more sophisticated look at the world when I listened to them. So Bob and Ray would do things, with they, they'd interview each other and they would say things like, well, uh, Mr. Ballou, uh, what, what, uh, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm the president of the STA. And Elliot would say, well, now that's a nice acronym. What does that, uh, what does that represent? He said, that represents the slow talkers <laughs> of America. <laughs> and then they would do uh, little radio uh, ads that they would invent themselves. They would see, say things like, insist on Einwinder's flypaper. <laughs> Whenever you need fin the finest, world's finest flypaper and flypaper accessories, <laughs> insist on Einwinders. <laughs> and uh, that struck me so funny. I, and uh, it somehow opened up some doors for me, and I began to see life beyond the way I was living. And, and it just welcomed all kinds of things. So yeah. the idea of humor and all that came to be. Mm. Uh, and this is you as a young boy. <laughs> you can see you're wearing your uniform in this picture. You've also got the paper route bag. And you appear to be drawing comics. I'm drawing comics, and I'm sitting on a chair that's about to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, it's got the no back, back knocked off of it. And this was one of those stations where they delivered the newspapers. And uh, hmm. uh, it was just crumbling. I mean, the little station were metal buildings and they had wooden floors there and they had an old style um, stove that they would burn wood in to keep mm -hmm. warm you know wow. this goes back a few years yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. Uh, and no one ever called department of human services i'm su surprised <laughs> child well, labor laws was, were different there wasn't a department of services <laughs> So we were wondering if you could tell us more about this painting. Um, it's an extraordinary one, not terribly typical of your work. Um, and it's also located in Seoul, Korea. So we sadly couldn't borrow it for this show. But um, what is the story behind this painting? Well, this is uh, called The House on 38th Street. It was right near um, Klassen uh, on 38th Street. And um, it was like a 
a memory reflection on a girlfriend that I had, and she lived in this house. Oh. So, wow. direct Patty connections. Callahan. And there Patty she Callahan. is. <laughs> <laughs> Who I had a number of adventures with, uh, west and in, in California, and she now lives in San Francisco. Oh my goodness. And still in touch after all these years. I haven't talked to her for a few years, but uh, she's out there. Yeah, <laughs> in the best way. Well, and, and now she's famous. She's on YouTube and Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and Ed, this is uh, an image of you from the Chamber of Commerce. Shout out to the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, where at age 18 in 1956, you were being awarded first prize for a graphic design competition. So your interest in graphic design predates art school. Any thoughts on how you got interested in graphic design at Northwest Classen or earlier? Uh, maybe just looking at print material and this design I'm holding up here is, uh, has to do with a uh, um, halftone dot pattern, mm -hmm. which actually I have in one of my paintings here uh, on, the, on the wall down here, yeah. up here. And, uh, and also, a good friend of mine is on the right-hand side, far right-hand side, Jack Taylor, uh, who became uh, an investigative reporter and uh, was with the Karen Silkwood case. Oh, oh wow. So that's Jack Taylor on the cool. right. Huh. Yeah. Nice. He may not be alive today, and I think he, w he was a reporter from in uh, Denver. Oh, that's great. So at age 18 in 1956, you embark on the open road? Yeah, so I've never been to Oklahoma City until now, but I've been looking at your work for many years now, and it's been such a revelation just to be in the city and think about how your work is very clearly influenced by the landscape here. Um, so this book you did pretty early in your career, and it, it refers both to Oklahoma and to Los Angeles and to points in between. Um, could you tell the story of how you decided to do this book? Um, I traveled a lot between here and California, and uh, all along the way, naturally I had to stop for gas, and uh, I somehow just centered on this idea of making a book about photographs of gas stations. And uh, that came out of my uh, knowledge about the history of Oklahoma and the Grapes of Wrath mm. had a big effect on me, the movie Grapes of Wrath. And uh, um, I began seeing things like in a black and white world. And uh, so these, these pictures just kind of came together and I, um, I wanted to make this. I wanted to make a book, and I needed an excuse to make a book. So I thought, how about this? Here, I have an excuse. Now I can make a book. <laughs> and uh, I, I recall reading a story that you had learned about the Library of Congress and decided that you'd send the book in. And what happened after that? Uh, I got a return letter from the Library of Congress saying. Thank you for your submission of this book for our Congress, but we have uh, decided not to accept it. And uh, rejection can be hard. A rejection, <laughs> yeah, it was a rejection slip, and believe me, that thing is framed. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I think I've even got gold around it. But and then I understand from people today that if you give anything to the Library of Congress, even if it's pornography they have to accept it. Right. Huh. So it's a different world today. Yeah. So that was back in the 60s. Yeah, it's funny. And what about this are. is not a book that yeah. <laughs> makes it not qualify. So after you framed it and gilded the frame, you took out an ad in Art Forum. The ad in Art Forum said, uh, Ed Ruscha, 26 gasoline station, banned from the Library of Congress. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which, I wanted to rub it in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it also seems to me to be an extraordinary media play. You took a rejection and you turned it into a hot topic. If you were banned, probably people wanted to read that banned book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So the standard station has been a recurring theme in your work. There's standard stations in the 26 gasoline uh, station book, and then it's a subject that you've returned to again and again, um, as in MOCA standard here. So what is it about the standard station in particular that interests you? Uh, I, I love the shape of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I um, thought that maybe someday I might like to live in a gas station where I can pull <laughs> my car up underneath the canopy and just park and go, in, <laughs> go inside, have a little studio, maybe live in it. And then the standard uh, lettering on the, on the main sign also has a kind of zoom feeling, almost like a mm. freight train. Yeah. And um, it was simple kind of graphics that made me have to get this painting down on canvas. Yeah. Driving around today, I noticed just how many gas stations there are in Oklahoma yeah. City, and the architecture is amazing. Yeah. Don't like forget cannabis has, stores. <laughs> I, many of them are now, yes. They're making good use of it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's so interesting to see like the Art Deco gas stations and the modern 50s gas stations like this. So I can see why they were very much on your mind. Frequently with the oblique angle, the strong diagonal of the awnings yeah. you drive under to access yeah. the, the gas. So years later, after you worked out the first time with 26 gasoline stations, so you made a few more books and in 1966, you came up with this concept, which is also on view in the exhibition downstairs, every building on the Sunset Strip. And though it may seem to a casual observer this has no relationship with Oklahoma City, of course, that area, Sunset Strip, is part of Route 66, which passes right through Oklahoma City. Uh, but I've also heard you uh, tell that it has a connection to your time and your paper route as you were navigating the streets of Oklahoma City. Can you tell us how you first came upon the idea connecting architecture around Oklahoma City and eventually photographing uh, and documenting all of these buildings on the Strip? Uh, well, I actually had a far-fetched dream that I wanted to, uh, I had a friend named Malcolm Soule who lived down the street from us and he made a very meticulous paper um, a uh, replica of the Williamsburg, Virginia. Hmm. You know, the classic sure. center of Williamsburg, Virginia, with all the little streets and everything, and I was knocked out by this. And I thought, someday maybe I'll, it's got to come through for me sometime. And so I, at the same time, thought, well, I'll, maybe I'll do that of my paper route, and I'm going to have a, a little paper cutout of every house on my street. And, uh, you know, it's like a way of investigating your history or investigating your problems that you have with yourself. But anyway, this thing came about through photography. And I always liked the Sunset Strip. It's about a, it's a street that's about two and a half miles long. And uh, it's got quite color to it. And, uh, and so I, I, I just decided to photograph this thing and make some kind of Looks like a caterpillar from here, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it's uh, in Europe. I think they call it a leporello, and it's mm. really an, it's like an accordion fold. And I had uh, always just had dreams of making something uh, um, out of an accordion fold. And so here again was an excuse to do it. That's all I need is an excuse. Yeah, nice. <laughs> well, you, you did this in 66, but you're continuing to photograph the same street, right? Uh, yeah, I've been doing that for years and years. There's a, uh, a website for, from the Getty Museum that's called 12 Sunsets. And um, they acquired my archive of photographs because I would photograph every... Now, Sunset Boulevard is 26 miles long. Mm. And if you say north side, south side of the street, that's 52 miles of photography. And I've been doing that since, since the 60s. And uh, they made a, uh, like a video um, 
internet program out of this. So if you want to see all of the Presbyterian churches on mm -hmm. Sunset Boulevard, press a button, there they are, all photographs. If you want to see dry cleaners, there they are, all the dry cleaners. It's an amazing kind of uh, um, thing that they did with it, and it, uh, it involved a lot of expertise and something far beyond my interest, or they just built on this thing, and um, um, uh, it's pretty fun to navigate. We have on an iPad, we have 12 sunsets pulled up in the learning gallery. Oh. And you can drive a little car up and down the road. You can focus in yeah. on it. You can see the body shop that happens to still be there. I was just in LA. It's not for your That's automobile, right. by the way. It's a very different body shop if you catch my drift. <laughs> yeah. Still there. Yeah. Well, if you want strip joints on Sunset Boulevard, <laughs> here they are. There's like 14 of them or something. Wow. And uh, almost any subject that you chose to investigate, they could find it on Sunset Boulevard. Even if, like, uh, if you wanted to find out all the um, red lights that were in the cross streets, you mm -hmm. could find that mm -hmm. out, too. And uh, so it's quite, quite an amazing kind of thing. It's a great yeah. tool. So around uh, the same time, early 60s, you're fresh out of art school, and you start to get interested in uh, building on some of the tools of graphic design, uh, and you do numerous studies, one of which is on view, number seven, trademark number seven study for this large scale painting. What originally sparked your interest? What was the impulse behind painting the 20th Century Fox logo? Uh, well, this kind of kicked it off and I was looking at this, I've seen it forever and uh, we watched it on the silver screen forever and it always made a dynamic impression on us because it was the opening of a movie. And, uh, and this thing was really speaking to me in the same way that the standard station was. It's doing the same thing. It's, it's pictorially the same image. So there I go, just needing an excuse. And uh, uh, 20th Century Fox. And I like the noise aspect of it and, mm -hmm. uh, and all of that. So. And movement, too, yeah. that's such a constant in your work. Like well, when I was young, I, I saw movies, and I always liked the movies where they had uh, a connecting scene where people are traveling, and they're traveling on a train. And they'd always start, uh, the train was way off tiny on the right-hand side, and then very quickly, uh, like mm, that. So yeah. that's, that's, it's doing the same thing. Huh. And... Uh, so I guess I would pick that up from the movies. And yet uh, some more examples of what came to be known as pop art. Uh, around the same time in 1962, the first ever exhibition that really came to identify pop art as a movement, the new painting of common objects organized by Walter Hopps at the Pasadena Art Museum uh, included eight total painters, one of whom was you, one of whom happened to be Joe Good. So of eight total painters, you have two Oklahomans represented. Not bad for this state, I'd say. Uh, as delicious as spam is, Ed, what was the <laughs> excuse for, for getting into this? Well, I actually, I have to admit that I did live off of this stuff for a while. <laughs> I did live off this, and it is truly mystery meat. Uh, <laughs> And finally, I weaned myself off of it, but not before uh, I recognized the can as being something special <clears throat> in American life. And uh, I believe it originated in World War II for, for soldiers mm -hmm. were given this. And uh, it was like canned meat. I mean, there are varieties and examples of it today, as we know. And, um, and so I like the kind of vocal aspect of the word spam, which is like a noise sound, mm. a mm. guttural noise sound. So painting sounds seem like an option for me. No. Painting sounds, that's great. So there's an O sound at the beginning of this with a giant <clears throat> O. Alex, do you wanna talk a little bit about your experience with Ed going back 20 years, having worked on two books of the artist's work, 
Uh, and then for the first time working on this show and learning, uncovering yet another layer of his body of work so connected and rooted in Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, it's been so interesting to me working on this show because you are so closely associated with Los Angeles. And one of the books I, I worked on with you, I titled Ed Ruscha's Los Angeles. So I was so eager to look at your connections to Oklahoma. And, you know, once I started doing the research, I thought, how could I not have considered this more? It's so clear. Um, and then, of course, in your work, you come back to variations on the word Oklahoma and the word OK and variations on that. Um, when did you first start to want to bring Oklahoma in a concrete way into your work? Because for a while, it seems you were very kind of invested in being part of the LA art community as a student, and then you started to kind of think about home more, if that's not putting words in your mouth. Um, well, I, I feel like art is just a, um, you know, it's a, it's like a diary mm -hmm. and a diuretic. <laughs> 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 and, um, References, so I, I mean, I, you know, you got to find subject matter somewhere, and uh, it might as well be in your own history and things that you've thought about before, so that's where these things come from. It just it somehow comes from history. Yeah. yeah. So it, at this time, you start to experiment with a variety of different materials. So this work, for example, is gunpowder, creating these curved shapes to indicate letters, in this case, OKLA period, the abbreviation for Oklahoma, perhaps, or perhaps a reference to the state of Oklahoma and the city of Los Angeles, where you were from, where you were living. And then an, another work from the example uh, of gunpowder. We were just chatting about this uh, about an hour or two ago. This says Skytown, which I didn't realize until your brother informed me that Skytown is how some of the Oklahoma expats in LA refer to Oklahoma City. But then you told me another story that perhaps Paul was the originator, but it's because he misheard it. Huh. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. He, he invented it. Paul invented it, uh, but it came about through a, a mistake because he thinks that the person that said that, hey, I've been to Stytown or something like that. And he said, did you say Skytown? And then he just assume that it was Skytown and that's it. Hmm. So things get born from crazy origins. No. Speaking of crazy origins, gunpowder is an interesting substance to use for art. <laughs> How did you start experimenting with it? Well, it's made up of charcoal and salt and, and um, what's that product that comes from Kansas? What am I thinking of? Uh, Saltpeter? No, it's yellow. Not corn. <laughs> <laughs> Sulfur. 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 Thank you Sulfur. from the audience. Yeah. Nice lifeline audience. Thank and, you. And uh, for some reason, it um, I used it as an art medium just by mistake because it began to, uh, it was easy to correct mistakes and it also sort of went down easier and, uh, and I liked it a lot so that was like a simple thing to hang on to. What was the actual technique that you used? Because it, you know, it's so refined. Were you using brushes of some kind? Were you using like sponges? No, I mostly uh, like Q-tips and um, and pads, or, you know, cotton pads, things mm. like that. And um, um, but it's all like tricks and devices. Mm. So. You just use things that, uh, where it facilitates your statement. Yeah, yeah. And making sure it's stored in a climate controlled facility. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so toward the uh, end of the 60s, gunpowder wasn't the only material you were <clears throat> experimenting with. You really began to pick up on food and that's an area that Alex identified as we were reviewing a lot of the works that are in the show, is that food stuffs became an inspiration as a material, not just as a subject in the case of spam, but you began to use things like egg yolk, lettuce, carrot juice, and in this case, chocolate. Um, to me, the idea of taking chocolate and turning it into an art medium seems kind of mind-blowing, 
how did that happen in your process where you landed on chocolate? And then how did you take that from an idea to creating the large installation that would eventually debut at the 1970 Venice Biennale? Well, things fall, fall into place chronologically. So I was in London making some print images with uh, using uh, uh, natural sources like flowers and, and um, caviar and axle grease and, and um, chocolate. And I wanted unconventional materials to make these images out of. And then I, I somehow got a, I fell into this invitation to come to Venice Italy and make at the American Pavilion, they gave me a room and said, well, do something. <laughs> and so uh, I, was, I was just thinking about, well, I was just make an extension of something that I was working on in London. And, um, and I pictured the idea of uh, printing like shingles of chocolate on paper hmm. and then hanging the shingles just like a bricklayer would hang, would, would uh, put up a masonry wall, one on top of the other. And um, so it just became an environment. I just remember the last thing that happened. It was kind of tricky and intricate to do it. But I remember leaving Venice, and it was very humid. And as I was leaving, I saw a little trail of ants going inside. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner. Uh, we, we have not yet seen any, uh, any ants, and for any potential lenders out there, it's because of our expert pest management control system. <laughs> uh, but we have had a great time with this as an installation, and a little bit of context for our audience here. The process was melting, breaking up 100 pounds of Hershey's chocolate, melting that chocolate, pouring the melted chocolate onto a screen printer, and then printing that onto pieces of paper, which then, as you described, are hung like shingles in the space. Uh, yeah. And I have a highly uh, sensitive sense of smell, which is actually the worst superpower that one can have. <laughs> so I can still smell the chocolate. Not everybody says they can, but I can still smell it. But when it was first being installed, it was like we were in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. It was a magical <laughs> sensory experience. And you did that all yourself in Venice. Did they well, give you I a had screen some help. print? I had some help. No. Um, now, I was just reminded of this photograph I saw of my junior high school building. I'm, I'm changing the subject here, Do but it. Don't, don't worry about <laughs> it. Uh, um, it was the f a photograph of Taft Junior High School. And uh, I had a vivid memory of being at that place. And I was in a swim class. And the coach said, at the swim class, he says, I'm having uh, a Native American, he didn't call it that then, he said Indian. That's OK. That's historical context. But um, he says, this, this man is going to come in and do a little demonstration for us. And uh, so we waited there. And uh, this uh, young man comes in. And he, uh, he's got a pair of swim trunks on right next to the pool. And we're all sitting, sitting around watching what he's going to do. And um, he puts a feather back in his head like this. The feather sticks up. And uh, he plunges into the pool into um, sort of the, the medium depth and he just stays there. And so everybody's quiet, not asking any questions. We're, after all, watching a demonstration. And, um, and so five minutes goes by, six, seven minutes go by. And um, this man is not into trickery or anything like that. He didn't have a, you know, a, a hose or anything like that. Wow. But um, he was just not too far off uh, the surface of the water, not too far below. But anyway, he was still there. And then finally, some of the students were, they had stopwatches and they had wristwatches and they're saying, Okay, well, it's been like 10 minutes. <laughs> this guy's been there, and he's very qu quiet and still, making no motions or anything like that. And finally, uh, you know, 12, 13 minutes, and people were, jaws were beginning to drop. Hmm. And uh, finally, it was like 13 and a half minutes, this guy comes out of the water. 
And that was a pretty good demonstration to me, and I thought, I, none of us could do that. And this man didn't even hyperventilate or anything like that. And, uh, and then only recently I've searched it out, and the world record is like 24 minutes, I think. But that's wow. if you hyperventilate. Anyway, that's my Taft Junior High School story. <laughs> How about Taft Junior High? And you, you mentioned language in the vernacular, and in the newspaper business of which you used to be a part, Ed, I think they call this a segue. So uh, language and vernacular. In this case, you've got a painting from uh, the early aughts, a series of mountain paintings that you were doing. Uh, and this happens to be, for the benefit of the audience who can't necessarily read this, what we call a palindrome, which means it is a word that is the same or a phrase that is the same, whether it's read le left to right, or right to left in the English language. Uh, to me, don't nod sounds like something a, a parent would say to a child in church. Hmm. How did you land on, on this phrase and some of the other ones that uh, you, you write down and list as you hear people speaking? Uh, I got intrigued by this um, uh, palindromic idea. And, uh, and so I thought, well, maybe pictorially I could reduce this to some kind of idea of having a symmetrical image, the same image on the right as on the left. And uh, that's kind of where it came from. And um, by the way, Tulsa slut is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Spells the same way. So Both directions. <laughs> as I happen to grow up in Tulsa, everybody knows. <laughs> I've just insulted him. And Tulsa is a slut backwards. No, we all know this. <laughs> and I actually took out the images that Alex wanted to put in, and now I'm kicking myself because I thought it would be too racy for our audience. But it is a known fact. Tulsa is a palindrome. <laughs> Speaking of the same series and phrases. This is the best one. So figure it on out, which I love, and as someone who grew up in Osage County in Tulsa, I hear this phrase and immediately springs to mind the vernacular, uh, which Ralph Ellison described in a, an essay called Going to the Territory that really the vernacular is about um, reaching toward perfection. Um, so I think all of us Oklahomans can uh, take solace that when we use vernacular language, we are endeavoring to perfection. Uh, but figure it on out with its double use of the preposition, it just rings of Oklahoma vernacular. But you have a story that goes directly to this phrase. Uh, not much of a story, but... Um, um, well, not like the I think I owed, guy. I owed someone for um, a carpentry task and when he, he said, well, okay, I'll figure it on out. And I, I like that, on out. It's so disruptive. It's, not, it's probably not really correct English uh, in the same way that you might say, he up and went downtown. Mm. Um, oh, <laughs> wow. This was Perfect. not planned. This was not planned. <laughs> that was not planned. That was spontaneous. Yeah, That's that was pretty amazing. good. That was pretty good. <laughs> Serendipity. Sometimes it works out. So, Alex, you actually brought this series to our attention when we were talking about, when we were organizing the exhibition and going through our wish list. Do you want to talk a little bit about this series and what caught your eye? Oh, sure. Um, well, Ed, you can tell this much better than I can, but these are all made on drum skins and all refer to phrases that, as I understand it, are all coming out of things that you've heard, either in Oklahoma or somewhere else. And I understand that you've been collecting drumskins for a long time, and I was wondering what about drumskins seemed like a good support for a work of art, and, and why did you decide to do them now, having had this drumskin collection for many years? Well, it just uh, about, 40 years ago or so, maybe more, I was downtown Los Angeles and there's a, a leather company that had a table, a large table. It was just plopped with all kinds of things for sale and they were things that uh, had to do with leather or animal skins, mm. things like that. And so parchment and vellum, you know, they're animal skins, they're um, uh, beautiful to look at. And they were, uh, in this case, they were round and they were cut off in odd shapes. 
irregular shapes, and they didn't qualify to make uh, drum skins. So they were just like selling them for a couple of dollars a piece, and I, I just liked them because they were so beautiful. And I kept them, looked at them, put them away, looked at them again, never thought, thinking to do anything until about 40 years later. Hmm. And I thought, gosh, I mean, people have painted on vellum for many, many years. I mean, for centuries. Indians painted on vellum. Um, and so I, I don't know, it's just the, the combination of those things came together and I was, I was um, in this spell about where I grew up in Oklahoma and how mm -hmm. people used to, the way people used to talk and, and uh, there are sort of cliched ideas about, I mean, women used to joke, they would say, I'm gonna walk up the hill in my high hills. <laughs> or I wanna borrow a pair of pliers. <laughs> um, or um, I can't find my keys nowhere. And uh, I, I like that rhetoric and, uh, and it had a regional distinction to it that I, I thought was powerful English. Yeah. And so getting it down sort of made it official, official to me. Yeah. And um, that's, that's about, it, about it. Do you <laughs> feel like you still hear those kinds of phrases or <clears throat> have they sort of gotten lost, that kind of vernacular uh, I remember about 30, 40 years ago, some um, sociologist said, we're gonna lose the Southern accent because mm. of television. Yeah. And um, I thought, boy, that guy's right. You know, we're gonna lose, there's not gonna be any more down home Southern accents anymore because of the crush of TV and making it so unified in the whole country. But it's never really proven to be true. I mean, mm. it's, they still, if you go down south, you would hear that rhetoric. And if you come here, you hear bits of rhetoric like that. So it hasn't exactly dissipated and it hasn't become one thing uh, unto itself. So, mm -hmm. um, so maybe we're living in an okay time. Yeah, <laughs> less homogenized than maybe we thought we would be. <laughs> so Ed, this is a, a painting Mother's Boys from 1987, and there actually are words painted on this painting, but they have been painted over with uh, what you see on the bottom, the, the center bottom of the painting, the composition, is something you described as a censor strip. So you painted over the title of the painting. Uh, well, actually, not so. Mm. This is uh, constructed this way on purpose, and uh, I don't know whether you can see it here or not, but that rectangle there, one side is slightly mm -hmm. higher than the other side, and mm. I, uh, that seemed to me, to me at the time, to be an important decision. And uh, painting the flag, I just wanted to paint a flag, um, and I. I recognize that all art comes from other art, and uh, what happened to Betsy Ross? She, she created this thing. I'm just imitating it, and other people have imitated it too. But uh, so in any, any case, I just wanted to, the idea of the fun of play, painting an American flag, and then the abstract quality of this block down below uh, seemed to me to be an important element in this picture, and it's like an abstract uh, addition. Mm. So if, to follow the American flag, there's something special about this particular work. Uh, it is the first time that this object is being displayed in an exhibition, is our understanding, and you had it framed specifically for Ed Ruscha OKLA. Uh, it's already made of your detached uniform sleeve from the U.S. Navy Reserve. Um, so we're curious, and I mentioned new painting of, of common objects. You had the chance to meet Marcel Duchamp, the, perhaps the godfather of conceptual art, who really developed the idea of the ready-made, an object that was found in the world, and then the artist 
puts it on a pedestal and calls it art. Uh, was there a connection between your time meeting Duchamp and your creation of this work? And why, after all these years, were you interested in, in having it on display here in Oklahoma? Um, no, I wouldn't say that Duchamp had much to do with this, except that he introduced us to the f found object, which is a, an, a, an important discovery have, having to happen about 1913 or so. Uh, finding objects and like just saying, this is, this is a work of art right here because I say it is. Mm. <laughs> and he was, you know, he was a, an innovator in his own way, but I mean, in a sense, this thing is really doing the same thing. I mean, it's a found object. It was a sleeve to my uniform when I was in the Navy Reserve. And uh, then, you know, the hash mark on there meant that I had been uh, spent four years in this Navy Reserve. Mm -hmm. And then, so the hash mark being at an angle like that and tipping the th sleeve at an angle like that is like double angles and then you've got the, the insignia up there with some other angles. And so it's uh, an eye jumble of, of uh, angles. Mm -hmm. and, it's and just so many of another anymore. picture, yeah. And I really don't even call this a work of art. It's more like a keepsake. Mm -hmm. When did you detach the sleeve from the rest of the uniform? Recently, uh, or was it like that? It was a big thing for me to take those scissors out. <laughs> 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 so, Ed, we're, we're coming at, uh, at the end of our, our time here. So I thought it would be a good idea to <laughs> chat about this guy. <laughs> series of rusty signs that uh, you made almost 10 years ago, about nine years ago. Several of them uh, with dead end. This is dead end, rusty signs, dead end two. Uh, would you care to talk a little bit about your process for the mixographia uh, uh, printing technique that you used here or how you came upon the idea for replicating rusty signs? Uh, there's a Mexican family that lives in Los Angeles and they have a workshop called Mixographia. And um, it's a really unusual shop in that they make um, uh, embossed paper works. Mm -hmm. And if you can picture this thing, these letters here are raised away from the background. And they have their own te technique for doing that. And, uh, and I travel in the desert a lot, and so I see rusty signs all the time. And they make an impression on me. And so, I th again, I was thinking, I'm in a place here where I'm offered services to make something. And so I think I'll work with these people. And that's how this comes about. Hmm. And we uh, kick this idea around for quite a, quite a bit. Um, a plate is made, and then they, they apply the the inks to the uh, to the plate, hmm. and then they put a, a, a kind of a sausage-shaped um, pulp, wet pulp, and they run that through a press, and that makes the image and prints the image at the same time. So it's really unusual wow. method, and uh, I'll probably do something with them again. Well, what I love about this work uh, is, to me, it also speaks of rural roots in the state of Oklahoma, not just for the rusty quality of the sign, but if you can see out in the audience, uh, there are four, four bullet holes, which appear to be a 22 caliber to me, <laughs> country boy that I am, and I can attest that every sign, and back me up on this, James Pickle, every sign you see out in rural Oklahoma, that, as soon as that sign gets up, it's used for target practice. <laughs> and each of the dead ends that you've made, there are bullet holes in them. Yeah, um, that reminds me of a friend I had, the late Rainer Bannum, who was a mm. British uh, author, and he uh, loved uh, the desert, and he loved coming to America, and uh, he, uh, he said, you know, I go out to the desert, and..." Uh, and the amazing thing about it is that nobody shoots at anything unless it's man-made. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, at, at this time... What's uh, the use of shooting a tree? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, at this time, Ed, uh, I would like to welcome um, to the stage the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, David Holt. Uh, mayor Holt has a special honor uh, that he would like to bestow upon you. And so, Mayor Holt, I turn to you. Well, thank you, Ed, if you wouldn't mind joining me. Yes, let's give Ed a round of applause. Well, Ed, I have so enjoyed engaging with your work in recent years, and my whole family, ages 9 to 42, have thoroughly enjoyed this very special exhibition here. But as mayor, it is really your life that inspires me and all of us. And because you are a reminder that you can come from Oklahoma City and impact the world. And I started my day today by driving by your childhood home on 17th Street, because it really put me in touch with the reality of your story that though you are a living icon to many millions of people, you are just Ed from Northwest Classen, and that you can be both things simultaneously is, again, an inspiration to all of us. And I wanted to honor that tonight on behalf of the people of Oklahoma City. You could probably have some fun with the words that come with a I will. proclamation. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, Edward Joseph Fouché IV and his family came to Oklahoma City in 1941, and he graduated in 1956 from Northwest Class in High School in the Oklahoma City Public School District. And whereas, Ed then journeyed west to Los Angeles and began an art career that ultimately established him as one of the most iconic and influential visual artists in American history. And whereas, Ed's presence in art remain almost ubiquitous throughout Los Angeles, from museums to the mayor's office. True, Eric Garcetti, it's, you're hanging right behind him there in the mayor's office. And whereas the many honors bestowed upon Ed around the nation and around the world are far too numerous to mention here, but in Oklahoma, he was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 2005 and was named an Oklahoma cultural treasure by the state of Oklahoma in 2015. And whereas Ed's upbringing in Oklahoma City has greatly influenced his work throughout his career, and Ed recently told the Oklahoman that, quote, I left Oklahoma to come to California about age 18, and I felt like everything that has come since and in my work as an artist came together in one year of my life, and that's age 18. I'm just kind of a variation on a theme. It all comes back to the state of Oklahoma. And whereas, like other Oklahoma City natives, Ralph Ellison and the Flaming Lips, Ed has pushed his chosen art form forward on an international level in ways that have influenced generations of artists and Ed is truly one of the most globally influential people our city has ever produced. And whereas, as one of its first exhibitions in its first year in its new location, Oklahoma Contemporary has mounted Ed Ruscha, OKLA, the most important arts exhibition ever staged in Oklahoma. I'm saying it is, I wrote this. <laughs> and, and the first solo exhibition of Ed's work in his home state. And whereas Ed has returned to engage with the exhibition, his hometown and its people, and on this day it is most appropriate that we acknowledge our pride in him and honor him for his contributions to the world. Now therefore I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim June 17th, 2021 to be Ed Ruscha Day in Oklahoma City. This is almost like having a key to the city. Oh, what, a, what another serendipitous segue, Ed. Uh, it's like having a key to the city. I'm no, going to keep this thing with me at all times because I hate losing my keys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're going to take care of that here in a moment. And by the way, I do want you to know, I'm very loath to declare days uh, and only announce them at 8 p.m. because I feel like I've shortchanged the person. So Ed, Ed has known for a week that today was his day. So he has lived his whole day fully. He knew all day long that this was Ed Ruscha Day, and so did the people of Oklahoma City. But I do have one additional thing to address the, the challenge you sometimes face. And that is, we always want you to know that you are welcome here. And if the gates are ever shut, we certainly want to make sure that oh, you man, have the key. And so there is, in yeah. fact, the key to the city. Oh, that's so great. Yes. God. Yeah. Yeah, this is staying with me at all times. Yeah. That'll and fit right in your pocket. This is a great honor. This is a great honor. So. And I do hate losing my keys. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to get lost. Well, we are, we are very honored to have you here tonight. Thank you. Ed. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for sharing your Oklahoma City life with the world. And the people <clears throat> here tonight stand in place of the 650,000 residents of this city. And maybe one more time, we would like, on behalf of them, to show our gratitude to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. For those of you in the virtual audience, thank you for tuning in. For those of you who are here, it's time to have some fun and dinner in our Founders Hall dance studio. Join us. Okay. You did real good. Oh. <laughs>